Okay, so this video we're going to create our simple bookshelves. Now I have some resources at the top of the module. I'm not sure exactly how these appear on the mo mobile on a mobile device. So if you're looking at this on your phone, they may actually appear below. But if you're looking at it on a PC, the module tabs at the top have some ad additional resources. I want to preface this by saying especially if this is kind of your first real 3D model, uh, that in 3D modeling, there really is no right way of doing things, right? There are ways that go faster and are more efficient, and there are ways that create better models, perhaps, than others, but there's no right way. At the end of the day, if you created a bookshelf and it looks like a bookshelf, you did it. Um, however, if you created a bookshelf and it looks like a turtle, unless you were going for that, um, maybe that wasn't the right method. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start from a 3D shape for this. So I'm not going to be over here where we were last time in splines, but I'm going to go to the create tab, which is the plus sign, and the little ball at the very front, which is geometry. This is also the tab that is active when you first start 3ds Max. So if you first started the program, you're already in the right place. So under here in geometry, we have our basic standard primitives. Now, last week I asked you to create a scene out of standard primitive objects. Hopefully, um, you everybody was able to do that. That project has a couple of purposes. In one, it is to kind of get you used to working in three dimensions, which for many is the di most difficult piece of working in 3D. Now, you might be thinking, how can working in 3D be hard, uh, the hardest piece, when we live in 3D? But keep in mind, you're manipulating an object in three-dimensional space through a two-dimensional interface. So you're sitting in a 3D world, manipulating an object in a 3D world, but through a two-dimensional interface. And that's a little weird, you know? Um, and again, the three-dimensional world and, or space in 3ds Max isn't the same one you're sitting in. So the orientations don't match. So that's also something that can be a little bit challenging to get used to. So if you were having some trouble, keep in mind, that's incredibly normal. Okay? And if you didn't have any trouble and you thought it was easy, Maybe 3D modeling is the right place for you. All right, so we're gonna start with a simple box. Now, you probably noticed last week when we went through and created our primitive objects, each primitive object has its own set of parameters. So if I click, as I click through these, you can see the box parameters are different from the sphere, are different from the cylinder, are different from the torus, are different from the geosphere, the plane, the pyramid, etc. They're all different. The basic parameters are the settings you can manipulate to change the shape you'll generate. For us, um, we're going to be changing this thing to all kinds of things. So the parameters, they are really set up if you're going to be creating a more advanced shape, which is most of the time what we'll do, um, are there to give you a form to start from that will make your life easier. So starting from something that's a basically similar shape to what you're trying to make can be a lot easier than starting from something strange. So if I wanted to make a bookshelf, um, a square bookshelf starting from a sphere would be way more work. Is it possible I could do that? Sure. But that extra strangeness in the geometry I'd either need to correct or try to work with and either method would create a bookshelf that probably would have a less efficient mesh or uh, look bad which is maybe even worse. So I'm going to take the box and I'm going to create a box and for this one I can create either the top view front or left is going to be preferred. Remember we want to create things in our orthographic views. We don't want to create them in perspective. Um, too many weird things start happening when you start creating something in perspective. So here's the top, and again, I'm picturing looking down, and here's the front. Now, I'm gonna pull up and then I'm gonna click, and it may not be right. So just like I kinda said in the previous videos, sometimes it's easier to edit something after the fact than when we're making it. So I wanna make this close. I like this shape of my box, but I feel like it's too short. I want a taller shelf. And then this is totally my opinion. Notice I didn't really bother with the length, width, or height uh, settings on this. I just kind of drew the shape to something that I like. Now, in Max, often that's how we'll be modeling. We'll just be creating something, not really worried about the size. However, um, as you start creating things like assets for a game, many 3D artists like to work within the proper proportions to make sure they're getting things right. Now, I say 
proper proportions, but I will kind of add a little asterisk caveat that in a lot of games, the proportions of objects tend to be different than you would find in real life. The most obvious example for this is doorways. In real life, our doorways are pretty much set the size they are, and humans are pretty much the size they are. However, in games, because um, your character might be taller than average, sometimes you might make a bigger door. The other reason you might make a bigger door too would be as in many video games, there's a camera that's kind of like an invisible balloon following behind your person. So even though the person may fit through the door fine, the camera may actually have some trouble going through that door. So you'll find that things like doors in video games are often exaggerated in size. Now I'm not saying you have to do that for these objects, I'm just kind of giving you a heads up for future projects. Okay, so this looks pretty good. I'm pretty much happy with it. Um, we're ready to make a, a bookshelf or a cereal box or whatever we want to make, right? Now I'm going to come over here and where it says default shading, I'm going to turn on edged faces. That's going to make it so all my edges light up white. That's real important for modeling in an editable polygon because you want to be able to see those edges in any viewport. Now while I would always, always, always recommend creating your base shape in one of these orthographic views. Once you've made the model, go ahead and feel free to edit it inside perspective. In fact, sometimes mo editing the model in the orthographic views is incredibly difficult. Kind of where like creating the model in the perspective view often kind of introduces a lot of issues. So we don't want to do that. Save yourself some trouble. All right, so because this is still a primitive object, I can actually still edit the parameters in the Modify tab. Now the parameters that are located here, if I clicked on Box, are for a new box. They're, if I change them, they're not gonna change my model at all because these parameters would be for my next box. Since I've already made it, I gotta be working over here in the Modifier tab, modifying the shape. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go through and pick these, which one of these makes sense and which is what I want. So if you create it in the top view, they'll be the same as mine. If you create it in a different view, they might be different. Now keep in mind, this is your bookshelf. It does not have to look exactly the same as mine. All right, but I'm going to put the number of shelves that I think looks the best in this model. I can also modify the model. So if I feel like it looks a little wide or something, I can tinker with it here. Now. We are ready to create and edit the geometry of this object. Now, I will say this. Once we edit the geometry of this object, you can't go back and really edit the parameters. Now, it'll give you a warning. Remember in Max, it's kind of like playing Jenga. If you go to pull that bottom piece and it's going to fall, Max will always give you a warning unless you turn off the warnings. I don't recommend that ever. Even people that have been using Max for decades leave the warnings on sometimes because they want to make sure they're alerted when they're doing something that could mess something up. Um, again, I've been using this for years. I would never turn off the warning, even if sometimes it gets annoying. All right, so I can see if I want to make five shelves. Uh, maybe five looks better. I don't know. Or if I want to make four. Or if I want to do four, maybe shrink down my shelf a little bit. Now, I like a tall shelf. I'm going to go five. Again, my length technically is my depth here. So I'm kind of just kind of playing with it. Now occasionally you'll see those lines turn off in your viewer. That's because the lines that are turned on by to view are only one pixel thick. And so if you go less than a pixel, sometimes they can look like they're flickering. But if you go back to full size, you can see them again. All right, so I'm pretty happy with how that looks. Now I can do this two different ways. I can either right click on the object and go convert to edit poly. Now what this does is basically it's like flattening layers in Photoshop. One of the reasons why I recommend taking Photoshop for this class is I relate a lot of stuff to it. If you've had Photoshop, you know that if you collapse all your layers, your, your file will be smaller, you don't have to deal with as much stuff, there's no worry about organization, but all the things you've done are permanent, right? This does the same thing. If I do convert to editable poly, it will convert it to editable poly and it'll remove anything that might be in your modifier stack. I can also come over here, and I'm gonna hit E just to save me some time, and click edit poly. Now this adds it in as a modifier. Now for what we're doing, it don't, we don't really need to keep it as a modifier because I'm gonna be editing this geometry. So we can't really go back without an error. So I could right click and do edit poly or I could do a modifier. 
it doesn't really matter what we want here. You'll notice that once we convert something to an editable poly, this ribbon at the top will come alive with lots of different buttons and features. And you may see it like this on your screen. So if you don't see it right away, you can click on this little white button as a drop down menu and, and open it up. There we go. So I can see these different tools. Now, a lot of the tools you'll find in this top ribbon are over here in the command panel. And I'm not really sure exactly why they've added them in both locations. Um, a few years when they first added this ribbon, I really thought they were going to get rid of the command panel because of that. I thought, well, okay, they're moving it all up here, so this is going to go away. But they haven't. Um, I will say sometimes it's more convenient finding the tools up here than it is down here. And there are some tools up here that are a little bit harder to find, find down here or aren't even available over here. All right, so what I'm going to do now that I have this and I have the number of partitions and everything set the way I like, I'm going to go to Polygon. Now, here are the sub-objects that make up your 3D shape. Vertexes, remember those? Same as last week. Vertex, edge. Now, this one's a little bit different. Border. Border would be wherever your object has a hole. It will select all the edges of a border. This box has none. So if I click border, there's nothing for it to click because there's no holes in my object. Um, polygon will collect surfaces. You can see. And then element will collect, uh, select rather, um, all of single objects. Element's a little bit difficult to explain right away, but you can think of it as if my face were a 3D model and my glasses were a 3D bot model and they were placed on my face, but I wanted them to be part of me as a character, but not actually welded and fused into my head, they would be like an element. So an element is an object that's attached, but not actually fused into the geometry itself. Okay, so we're gonna go to Polygon, and I'm just going to hit Control, and then click on all of these. Now you can either have Select and Move, or just Select, so if you're worried about moving it, that's fine. So I'm gonna click Control click, control click, control click, control click. Now, I could have also clicked and dragged to select something, but notice that would have selected all of them underneath the mouse. Even if I would have done it here in the middle, again, I might get the backside, right? And there are ways to turn off, like selecting the backside and stuff, but what we want to make our life easier is click, click, oh, I'm sorry, click the first one, then control click. Control click, control click, control click. If you accidentally grab one too many, you can hold an alt and click, and it will deselect that one. Control click. So I want all of the polygons on one front face. And then I'm gonna scroll down, and we're gonna use some of our edit polygon tools down here. For this one, I'm gonna do inset. Now there are two buttons next to inset. One large button that says word inset, and one little button that looks like a menu. The menu will be a pop-up, which will have settings that you can manipulate and have a lot more control. So if you're more of a control person and you wanna know exactly how much you're gonna apply something, <coughs> this menu is for you. Sometimes this menu is invaluable. Other times, you might just want to kind of wing it. For that, you can select them all and just click and drag. <laughs> yeah. Now, notice that it actually inset all of them. That's not what we want. So I'm going to use the control, control Z, and undo that. And then I'm going to use that little menu. Now, here is where I definitely want the menu because I want to inset them by polygon, which is different than setting all of them at once. I'm gonna pause this for just a second. Okay, I'm not sure if that's working or not. All right, hopefully it is. All right, so what I'm gonna do again, I'm gonna select all these, and then we're gonna change some of these settings, because by default, if I just click and drag it, it's gonna grab all of them and pull them in, but I wanna pull them all individually. So what we'll do here is instead of group, which is the default, we're gonna do by polygon. And then here by amount, I'm gonna pump them up a bit. Then just hit okay. Now, this setting will actually stay set that way. So when you go to inset something else, it'll do it pretty much the same way. So if I were to un undo it now and then did it with the big tool, 
notice it still kind of works the same way. So the menu and the by hand both are kind of part of how you can get this to work. All right, once we have that in set, all we're gonna do is we're gonna push these back. Now I would recommend kind of turning this a little bit and now I'm gonna to go to extrude. Now for this one, I am gonna eyeball it because that's fine. When I click and drag on it, it's either going to extrude forward, kind of like a toothbrush, or back. Now if I go too far back, you can see, one, you can see it clicking at the back, and two, also notice the shadings change that looks a little bit black and funky. That's because you have polygons crossing in themselves. So we wanna push it back, but not too far. Now what's cool is if I go a little bit too far back, I could just use my move tool along my Y axis here and pull it back by hand as well. Come on. So I don't wanna to get too close. Now see how it kinda of looks like stripes? That's when you have two things that are in the exact same space, you'll get flickering. Sometimes if you're playing a game and you see that, that's what you'll see. You'll see two polygons trying to render at the same time in the same space. Funky, funky stuff happens for that. So we don't want that, we wanna move it up just a little bit. And again, as long as you pulled those shelves back, but not so far back they stick out the back, you should be good to go. And that's gonna be pretty much it for our bookshelf. Now we could continue to modify it. I could grab the bottom if I want, for example, and maybe pull down a little bit. If I wanted to make a little bit of a you know, thicker bottom, we could. But that's gonna pretty much do it. Now next week we'll be jumping into materials. So we'll be able to do things like give this kind of a nice wood look.